Patroclus says, well, you're not going to go out and fight, but the uh, Greeks are going to lose everything, and I can't stay by your side even though I love you and even though I want to be a part of your plan to uh, just not fight until they give you back your girl. And Achilles says, go ahead, if you want to go out and fight, go out and fight. He goes out and gets killed by Hector. And uh, we're going to look at that in a moment, what happens after that. Okay, the first page, 88. Uh, one, of the, one of a whole number of deaths in the back of your book is a listing of all of the, I uh, won't turn to that now, I just want you to know it's there. There are three or four pages in which they list the number of people killed by each hero. <laughs> it's gruesome. It's gruesome. Diomedes was a wonderful man. I think there are 25 or 30 that he's killed. That's in, and they're listed in the back of the book. You know, th that would be, I suppose, for perverts who want to go and see how everybody died. <laughs> but, but it's part of Simone Bay's thing. She says, sometimes you have to overpower people before they see how terrible a thing force is. So let's, let's look at a couple of these deaths. Um, I'm going to go down to line 167. Uh, he says, he let them lie. That the he there is Diomedes. Diomedes, uh, Patroclus, is Achilles' closest friend. Diomedes <laughs> is Odysseus' closest friend. Uh, the, the Iliad has a wonderful pattern, and it likes to put people in groups of twos. And one of the tests for a hero is, can he take two lives out, like the tailor there, uh, five with one stroke, or whatever the story is. Diomedes let some others lie and went after Abbas and Polydus, the sons of old Eurydamas, who read dreams. But he read no dreams for these two sons when they left home. Diomedes cut them down and moved on. And there were two more brothers, Xanthus and Boon, sons of Phanops. And Phanops loved them well. And he was worn out with old age and its miseries. And he had no other son to be his heir. And Diomedes killed them too, taking their lives and leaving for the father sorrow and grief. They would not live to be welcomed home, and others would divide their inheritance. That's one of about 200 deaths, okay? Now here's the question. Choose life or choose death? It's the great question of the Old Testament. Is that passage about the glory of Diomedes killing two individuals with one blow? <laughs> or is it about the incalculable sorrow that he didn't take into account when he let the sword fall? Which is Homer asking you to pay attention to? Is he saying, what a great guy Diomedes is? Or is he saying, in any human death, even the death of an enemy, Terror, sorrow, and grief are all intermingled. Not we got 15 Iraqis today, but 15 families felt a terrible loss which it will take the rest of their lives to recover from. Okay, so let's take that and let's go on and find another one. Page um, 100. start about 582 there. This is Aeneas. Aeneas is a Trojan. Diomedes was a Greek. And we say what a Greek does, and he takes away a couple of Trojans. And now a Trojan by the name of Aeneas. Rome, Rome traced its heritage not to ancient Greece, but to Troy. Aeneas, one of the Trojans, uh, whose wonderful uh, skill in life was that he carried his dad on his back. His dad's name was Anchises. 
always reminds me of that wonderful thing that Father Flanagan's story, he ain't every father, he's my brother. <laughs> we can bear any burden when we're in love. We can bear any burden when we're in love. And this, this Greek this great warrior, Achilles, is noted for the fact that he carried his dad uh, on his back. Jack was uh, telling me the other day that many people who are angry carry their fathers on their back on a different way. Uh, and that's the, that's the mistreatment they receive from their fathers that, uh, that's an anger that they can't get rid of, and that's wise. But here we have this other wonderful sense that when, uh, when your, uh, your loved father or mother are too weak to make it on their own, your obligation is to carry them on your back. And that's Aeneas. But here, he's not carrying anybody on his back. Then Aeneas killed two of Greece's best, Crethon and Arsilochus, the sons of Diocles. Now, Diocles was a man of substance who lived in Ferre and who was descended from the river Alpheus, whose broad stream flows through the Pylian's land. And he had a child whom he called Orchilochus, and he begot him so that he might rule over many. This Orchilochus was the father of Diocles, and Diocles had twin sons, Crethon and Orsilochus, highly trained warriors. They had just reached manhood when they went with the Argives on the black ships to Ilium, famed for its horses, to win recompense for Agamemnon and his brother Menelaus, the sons of Atreus. But death enfolded them both in that land. <clears throat> they had just reached manhood when they went with the other Greeks. They were just at that point in their life where promise was most clear. You've got the choice. Is that passage about how Aeneas was able to kill two people at one time? Or is it about the terrible tragedy of the fact that war takes those who have the greatest promise and snuffs it out? So these two brothers, beaten to the ground by Aeneas, they fell like tall fir trees. You say, well, that's just dramatic. I don't know. I think that's something more than that. Let's look at 104 in Sarpedon. I see we're not going to get to the uh, highlight of, uh, of all of this in the sea fly Simone Bay. Um, says that, uh, that what she chooses is that this is an incredible anti-war poem written by a poet who believed, who belonged lock, stock, and barrel to a warlike society. And he was able to create a song which said to them, my God, could you think of peace instead of war? Uh, here we have a uh, Hector and go to line 733 there. Uh, uh, Hector uh, sees that Odysseus is about to kill uh, one of uh, Hector's uh, soldiers, Sarpedon. 732 in that. Hector was quick to see what was going on and strode through the foremost fighters, helmet shining above his flaming bronze. And he brought terror to the Greeks and joy to Sarpedon, who groaned as he spoke. Hector, son of Priam, don't let me lie here as prey for the Greeks. Help me. Hector wants to go and kill, but he's got this voice saying, don't kill your feet back. I'm one of the wounded. Become the medic. If I must die, let me die in your city, since I will never return to my own land to make glad my wife and infant son. And Hector did not waste any time answering, but sprinted past 
helmet glancing in light in his passion to drive the Greeks back and kill as many of them as he could. And godlike Sarpedon was made to sit beneath the beautiful oak sacred to Zeus, and Pelagon, his comrade, pulled the spear out of his thigh. But his spirit left him nonetheless. And a mist poured down over his eyes, and then the north wind blew upon him, and he breathed again, though he had already gasped out his soul. And his body becomes a thing so fragile that the wind comes by and forces air into the body. And it looks like something further than a breath, but in point of fact, the soul has already left the body. Well, those lines that I'll never return to my own land to make glad my wife and infant son. Is that about uh, the, the uh, power of Odysseus to kill Sarpedon? Or is it Homer saying, will you take into account what it is you do when you kill another? We'll come to see the answer to that um, next time. I'm going to try to do this in two seconds. I want to give us some time with uh, Menin Aeda Thea, Thea Deo Achilleos, Ulomene. And I, I want you to see that the first letter there is uh, called in Greek Mu, and it's exactly the same as our M. So there's no problem there. Everybody can write the first letter of main and night. The second letter, which occurs three or four times in this phrase, is called an eta, and it looks like a written N, and it's pronounced like a long A. A, so it's main, nin. The third letter, which is new in uh, Greek, is just like our N, except you leave off the first leg. The uh, fourth letter there is iota, and it's just like our I, it's the smallest Greek letter. It's the origin of our phrase, I don't give one damn iota. <laughs> that comes from the Greek. Huh? It's the smallest letter. It's the I, and it's made the same way, except they don't dot it. Here, the uh, uh, next letter in Aida is alpha in Greek. It's exactly the same as our A, but it's made like a fish, which reminded me, those of you who are uh, uh, helping those in need, you might have on the back of your car a fish emblem. Uh, the fish emblem is uh, one of the early ways in which Christianity disguised itself uh, in a culture that didn't like it. The Greeks and the Romans, uh, both uh, because of their interest in the sea, used the uh, fish as a symbol of belonging to a pagan cult. So the Christians started wearing it also, but it was a kind of a joke because the uh, first letter in Iklus is the first letter in Jesus. The second letter in Iklus, which is a chi, I'm the sweetheart of Sigma Chi, just looks like a big X, that's all, big X. The second letter in Iklus, this is the word, the Greek word for fish is Iklus, is uh, the first letter in Christos. The third letter, the third letter is uh, theta, uh, which is the first letter in the word God. The fourth letter, which is an upsilon, it's our U, it's exactly the same as our U. Remember, the Greek alphabet becomes our alphabet, is the first letter in the word uios, which means sun. So if, you, if, if you're wearing a fish on here, you're actually saying Jesus Christ, Son of God, and soter, which is the, um, which begins with the letter S, means Savior. So the Christians first made their, themselves comfortable and made Greece their home by adopting their symbols but having a different meaning for them. So uh, when you wear that fish symbol, you're actually saying Jesus Christ, Son of God, and a uh, Savior. The, uh, the letter uh, E in Greek is exactly what it is in um, English, except it's more curved. The letter uh, theta, like eta, is a, um, is a different, we don't have that uh, symbol in um, in English, but it's the TH sound. You all know what pi is, pi squared. Uh, and that's the letter P. The letter L is uh, called in Greek the lambda. And they just take the bottom of the L here and put it as a length there. The delta in Greek is RD exactly. The 
last letter of the Greek alphabet is omega. Is omega, and it's made like a W. It's just a long O. It's just a long O. And not only did the early Christians define themselves in terms of ichthus, but in uh, St. John's Gospel, Christ, or in the uh, Book of Revelation, Christ defines himself as the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and last letter in the Greek alphabet. And then Chi here is just the CH sound. Well, I've held people over, haven't I, Sister Lois? Sister Lois is going, don't you dare hold them any longer. <laughs> Did you want to say a few words, Sister? Well, you don't want to say a few words. <laughs> Sounded wonderful. Thank you. Okay, right along this way. And you please close your ears, Dr. Spring. All right. Dr. Spring is.